I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. I wanted to begin by responding to a question that came in a while back. You can find it in the chat sidebar if you like, um, which is the question about being guilt tripped. Let's see, there we are. KM at 49 minutes past the previous hour, uh, 5.49 for me in California here, asked, um, calling from New York, uh, would you be able to comment on how to navigate with people who manipulate you with guilt that you don't pick up on right away due to a family history of being guilted into not doing enough? Okay. And I want to respond sort of briefly to that as a way into my larger topic tonight. Uh, so if I understand the question right, we're with people who think we've done something worthy of guilt, and they are telling us that, or they're trying to make us feel that way uh, to get us to do th something, to feel bad or make amends or never do that thing again something like that. That's the basic setup. And the framing here in this case, if I'm kind of getting the vibe of it, is you know that those other people are, you know, maybe they're kind of inappropriate about it or they're pushy or you know, finger wagging. A softer version of it, which is also true and sometimes it's ourselves, we ourselves are the ones who is communicating that hey, something happened here that landed on me and I think it was wrong what you did. Like, how do we handle that? So I'm not gonna speak about how to communicate uh, an issue, a hurt, a grievance, a misunderstanding, or even a moral critique. Uh, I'm gonna talk right now about what to do when that's come across the net, as it were, in the back and forth of interactions, and there it is, kaboom. Something that has really helped me um, is to sort out whatever the person's communicating into three piles. And I call them moral faults, skillful correction, and gracious gift. Okay, so the moral fault pile is what is worthy of guilt. That, oops, I did something that I ought to feel guilty about or remorseful about or even ashamed about. That's that pile. The second pile is not at all a matter of moral fault. It's not about something that reasonably a, re a virtuous person would feel ooh, a wince of healthy remorse about. It's just skillful correction. It's just how to do it more skillfully next time. And then the third category is gracious gift, where it's not a matter of any kind of moral fault uh, it's also not really a matter of being more skillful going forward. It's just, you know, they they don't like the smell of mayonnaise. Uh, and so they'd appreciate it if you didn't open a big jar of mayonnaise at the kitchen table where they're eating dinner with you and slop a bunch on your on your sandwich. Like our daughter does not like the smell of mayonnaise. So uh, you just do it. It's no big deal. An example of this that you may have heard me talk about is, you know, my long-suffering wife in driving. Uh, it would make her nervous when I was racing down the freeway, having grown up in L.A., and um, she communicated it pretty much at the level of, you ought to feel bad about how you're driving, Rick. It's wrong. It's dangerous. You know, And I realized, you know, I'm not really driving in a crazy way, and it's not even a matter of being more skillful, but heck, why not slow down a little? get there five minutes later, whatever, give her the gift, all right? So this is a general approach that I find incredibly helpful, including the willingness to claim the power to decide for yourself what is in what pile. Even if they think everything belongs in the guilt pile and you're just thinking, you just prefer chocolate ice cream over vanilla. I brought you a vanilla ice cream cone you like chocolate more and you're all mad at me because I brought you vanilla. But, you know, honestly, I get it. 
you like chocolate, I'll bring you chocolate in the future. You get to decide. And that inner freedom to sort what goes where, usually much of it ends up in the skillful correction pile, uh, enables you to really be open to what it is appropriate to feel a little bad about for a bit in proportion to whatever has happened. And also this approach gets you out of arguments with other people about how bad it was what you did or what it meant or the fact that it's your fault that they are constructing a lot of negative reactions to what you said based on their history, whatever. That's a lot of other people wouldn't do with what you did. And they don't really need to do, but they're doing it. Okay. Instead of arguing about all that, you just zero in on what happened here. You try to understand it initially. And how has, how has this landed in you over there? You can have a lot of compassion for ex suffering in people that you don't take responsibility for. That's a really useful distinction. Or you realize that, okay, I what I said was what happened and you had that reaction to it. I don't think what I said was really bad or wrong. And I have compassion for your reaction. And going forward, lesson learned for you, I won't do that again. I won't say that again if you make that decision. This is really freeing. So I'll just leave it there. And although it gives me an opportunity to make mention of something kind of cool, my seventh book, What Was I Thinking?, <laughs> is coming out. January 17th, you might be interested in it. And it includes practices that relate to what I've talked about here, uh, including about sorting things into different piles. And as I talk about it in one of my 50 chapters, 50 short practices, uh, admit fault and move on or give them what they want. We can give people what they want, by the way, uh, without uh, accepting guilt about whatever has happened in the past you get to decide. So for me, that's been a really useful thing. And it's kind of a nice practical way to get into what I hope to talk with you tonight, which is about what I call loving freely. And what I mean by that is that, um, just as kind of a context here, uh, we all get challenged, right? There are challenges at all times. I think certainly in America, uh, maybe other countries, it can feel really pretty contentious uh, about values, politics, lifestyle, just the fundamental bedrock principles of commitment to telling the truth and commitment to playing fair. I mean, hey, what are we going to do about it all? And we can feel fairly invaded by frustration or hurt or anger. What do we do, right? Our kindness, our love, our compassion, our, our <clears throat> virtuous actions <clears throat> can feel very dependent on what other people do. They're not free, in other words. They're contingent. They're constrained. They're bound to what other people do, kind of like a, like a response that's bound to a stimulus. And I'd like to explore a different way of being, a way of being that is very centered in the Buddhist tradition. I think you can find it as well in other traditions of wisdom around the world, including those of the First People, the First Nations people. Uh, a way of being, a love, broadly defined, really broadly defined, that moves freely without obstruction. And it's not contingent on how others are. Um, this is a lovingness, a goodwill, a compassion and kindness in the core of your being that takes on a life of its own. Uh, more and more, this way of being, this free lovingness dwells within you and you dwell within it. This is what I'd like to explore with you. Um, loving freely, as I'm talking about it, certainly promotes individual healing because there's something that gets healed, including wounds of relationship, even traumatic ones in our childhood, as we rest more and more in a, in a lovingness that's our own, that, that is freely moving through us, um, it heals us as it flows through us. Amazing. I 
Don't know why that works exactly, for sure, not exactly, but it works. Also, uh, it improves our functioning. You know, it, it uh, lowers our stress levels, strengthens our immune system, uh, promotes emotionally positive experiences to love freely in this way, and we're more effective. It doesn't mean getting all gooey-eyed at work, like, oh, you know, do you love me as you, you know, give me some copier paper. We don't need to do that, but I just mean as we rest in more of a simple goodwill, a kind of open-heartedness, uh, looking for the good in others, you know, presuming good intent unless it's really indicated otherwise. We're more functional at work and in our everyday relations. And also, um, this way of being is a path of awakening, as I'll talk about a little more, um, you know, with a little more detail really pretty soon. Um, now, very important point, which is why I started with your right to sort things into the three piles. Amidst and alongside this loving freely, can be and must be taking care of yourself and doing what you need to do to take care of others that you care about. And um, alongside this is seeing people clearly. This is not about rose-colored glasses or heart-colored glasses. Um, and it includes standing up for yourself firmly, standing up for you know, what you believe in and against what you oppose. So let's, let's explore this together. Uh, and then hopefully we'll have time for some questions and discussion, including perhaps with some people live. Um, in Buddhist practice, uh, even though Buddhism is sometimes regarded as like the, a grim religion, if it is a religion, uh, kind of dour, you know, you suffer, you die, rinse and repeat, you have to do it all over again. Ugh. In fact, uh, there's a tremendous amount of emphasis in the original early teachings of Buddhism, dating back 2,500 years, on community with others, one of the three jewels uh, of Buddhist practice alongside the teachings and, and the example of the teacher and, and ultimately the inner teacher within all of us. Um, so we have one of the three of those already foregrounded is a community of practice. There's also a very strong emphasis on moral conduct or virtuous conduct, non-harming toward others, uh, a kind of unconditional um, you know, care and concern and compassion for others that omits none. This is really foregrounded in Buddhism. Also, there's this fundamental principle. It's the opening lines famously in the Dhammapada, translated in various ways. Uh, I'll translate it here as mind is the maker of all things. Really, it's not that mind is making this water bottle in, in some cosmic sense. Uh, it's more that our basic attitudes, the origin point within us, this, the nature of our own consciousness, uh, the qualities that we've cultivated inside ourselves make our experiences, very much shape our experiences, certainly. And the question then becomes, what is that origin point in you? And as the origin point in you is increasingly infused with an unconditional open-heartedness that omits none, um, that uh, is the origin point of your own practice. The lovingness that flows outward from you is an expression of your own unshakable core, not dependent on others. Now, a friend of mine went to uh, Thai, uh, Burma and Thailand, mainly Thailand, to practice uh, as a monk. He was a monk there for about nine years. And he came home and I asked him, hey, did you meet anybody who is enlightened, right? And he looked at me and smiled. He said, well, you know, for them, it's, you, they watch you for years and you know, they kind of see what's going on because you're all living together. Uh, but yeah, yeah, he said, I did meet some people that were considered to be really far along. And I asked him, what were they like? He said, well, first off, they, they had energy. They were helpful. They didn't just withdraw and gaze at their navel all day long. And second, they were always the same. I went, what do you mean always the same? And he said, well, I don't mean, I mean, sometimes they were quiet. Sometimes they were lively. Sometimes they were really sweet. Sometimes they were firm about the way it needed to be. But throughout, uh, they, they were loving. If you treated them really well, they loved you. If you treated them badly, 
they loved you. <laughs> Their love was not conditional on um, you know what you did, all right. And so, also I want to add that in Buddhism, which does have an emphasis on insight and kind of an analytical understanding of your own mind. I mean, it's quite strong that way and is, quite, and is akin to much of Western psychology or modern psychology, I should say. Nonetheless, uh, work from different scholars, including Richard Gombrich in his wonderful book, What the Buddha uh, Thought, right, which plays on another classic book, What the Buddha Taught, um, Gombrich has pointed out that in the early teachings of the Buddha, he really lays out that love is a wholly sufficient path of awakening alongside insight and um, uh, deep training, uh, deep training of the mind. So love laid out, right? Um, loving freely undoes the inner bonds of the self, really releases the self-contraction, a major causal factor in our craving and suffering and harm is the clench of the self, me, mine, right? Whew, we love, opens, you can just feel it. You feel that kind of opening in your body. Uh, the nature of being is opening or the action of being is opening, it's expanding, it's spacious, it's inclusive. Being is including, right? And uh, in that act of opening and including, oof, we were we release the contraction of I. Um, liberation, it's another word for being free. This freeness, freedom to love, you know, not being invaded by the reactivity and the kind of poisonous rancor and ill will of others, retain, gives us the chance to retain that freedom which is in which we are liberated from our habitual reactive patterns. Liberated from, freed from, through the freeing power of love moving through you. And this all may sound very lofty and like I've just been drinking too much New Age Kool-Aid. In fact, you can look directly into your own experience and feel the truth of what I'm saying. Look directly into what it's like to be you as love moves, moves through you. And as you uh, rest in love in the deepest levels of your being, you can have the sense of resting in the continual emerging of the universe now. This is not a religious statement. This is an empirical statement grounded in science. The universe is always emerging now as the space-time bubble of the Big Bang universe both expands in space and in time. And this expansion in time uh, enables the next emergent moment. And so as you rest in the emergence of love deep down inside, um, you get closer and closer to the emergence in the next moment of the universe. And that endless emerging uh, feels so rich and generous and such a giving as it's emerging that it feels like a loving wellspring in the core of your own being. You know, a loving wellspring in the heart of the cosmos, continually emerging and getting in touch with that freeing and freedom of loving um, can help you live in what Henry Schuckman, my friend and, and teacher, calls uh, original love in the ground of all, a kind of love uh, in the endless uprising generosity of the cosmos. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> there you are watching political TV and all these reactions start to maybe arise in your mind and you just uh, keep resting in that arising love. So, as the Buddha taught, with goodwill for the entire cosmos, cl cultivate a limitless heart, above, below, and all around, unobstructed, without hostility or hate. I'm going to put that in the chat. It's a lovely practice. 
Now, besides a kind of lovingness that seems inherent in each emerging moment, it's pretty deep stuff, yeah? In a much more kind of ordinary sense, but still really important, there's a deep lovingness in each of us that's embedded in our biological nature as a big, sociable ape. Trusting in this lovingness that is in your own nature, you, really, like, oh, me? Yeah, you. <laughs> Trusting in that lovingness that is biologically rooted um, can really help you dwell more into it, uh, dwell more in it. You know, if you just think about the evolution of the nervous system, 600 million years, what a long, strange trip it's been. We have these little jellyfish-like creatures in the primordial seas, and creatures get more complicated. Eventually, some crawl out onto the land, you know, start becoming, you know, crabs and reptiles. And, and then roughly 200 million years ago, mammals start emerging. Uh, you know, warm-blooded creatures who could hunt at night at live births and started to really become attached to their young and protective and caring in a loving way. And then as time passed and the um, asteroid whacked the earth about 665 million years ago, and whoof, that was it on the dinosaurs, our rat-like, rodent-like, you know, mammalian ancestors crept out into the ecological niches that were available and they kept evolving. Primates arose around 50 or so million years ago, very social in their, in their bands. And then around two and a half million years ago, those primates became smart enough and complicated enough. They started making stone tools and began living increasingly sociably with each other. And then eventually humans developed around 300,000 years ago with their social brains living together, forming a unique strategy for social life, unique among hundreds of primate species who are organized around alpha dominance in their social life, uh, what Paul Gilbert and others have called holding and controlling, holding on to food, controlling reproduction, alpha dominant strategies. Um, humans, unlike any other uh, primate species because of our big social brain in the conditions of hunter-gatherer bands when there is factually common truth, common welfare, and common justice, because you're living together, 40 or 50 of you, your whole lives. Um, we developed a strategy called caring and sharing as the foundation of social life. In other words, compassion and justice as how our hunter-gatherer ancestors survived together and live together in really harsh Stone Age conditions for 97% of the time, 300, over 300,000 years, 97% of the time, our, uh, the humans have walked this earth. They lived on the basis of caring and sharing until eventually agriculture enabled these large populations and large surpluses that promoted wealth and power. And it's been kind of Game of Thrones in many ways ever since, which can obscure your fundamental nature at bottom at bottom, really, uh, compassion and justice, caring and sharing. And you can feel that. Um, you know, even deep down inside yourself, you can recognize that we suppress many things and sometimes what we suppress is love. Uh, I went through Rolfing, which is deep tissue body work in 1975, probably, it's maybe six. And um, I was really scared of the fifth session, which goes into your belly, you know, your gut. And I was like, oh my God, all this pain, and you know, it's gonna come out, all this suppressed stuff. And instead, uh, my Rolfer's name was Mira. Uh, when Mira was working on my belly, all this repressed love was released. And I'm not prone to energy experiences. I've had some, and this was unusual. It was like this energy was moving through my body. I was lying on a table. It was like it was like a searchlight almost coming out of my belly area. Whoosh. That my Rolfer Mira, who was a pretty down, very down to earth, let's, you know, squeeze out the dents in your carriage, Rick, you know, your hardware, bang them out, a few dents. 
she just hung out at the end of the table, kind of soaking in, basking in this energy of love pouring out of me that I had suppressed hundreds of times in my, you know, kind of struggles and conflicts with my parents. And um, wow. So you might ask yourself, what love in you have you repressed or suppressed or withheld uh, or been afraid of releasing or sharing that's actually innate within you? you know? And you can take refuge in more and more. It's really helpful to claim for yourself. You might start conceptually, but you can increasingly rest in it experientially in your living body that you're a fundamentally kind and decent person. You might even say it to yourself, I am a fundamentally kind and decent person. It doesn't mean you're always like that. Sometimes we get really whacked by life and we, we go into survival mode and we get very reactive. Okay, um, but, but that's an aberration from your true nature, your resting state. You can even use your name. You could look at yourself and say your name. Like I spoke with Sylvia earlier today. Sylvia, you are a fundamentally kind and loving person, kind and decent person. And knowing that you are naturally compassionate, kind, open-hearted, and loving is a relief. And it's also a place you can rest. And if you acknowledge that that really is naturally you, it's like it opens a door to resting more there. Now, in addition to being a naturally kind and decent person, um, there is a place, excuse me, there is a place for will. There is a place for hiccups, loving at will. So, in my 20s, I was in a relationship with someone who I cared about a lot. And um, this person started doing stuff that was really uh, provocative and problematic in the relationship. Kind of shocking, actually. And I had a fundamental choice. Do I blow them off or do I choose to love at will? And I chose to love at will while well knowing that I would keep observing what was happening and I wasn't going to put up with it forever. But meanwhile, I just chose to love. And it was a wild thing because I didn't realize that we could actually choose, that there's a role for volition. There's a role for the will. We can decide to rest in love and then we can give over to this intention and we can cultivate it and strengthen it. I've been very moved by this quotation from the Dalai Lama who said, as soon as I wake up, I think about altruism. That's his word, which we could maybe more um, colloquially uh, translate as or think of as, I, you know, I think about how much I care about others and how much I wish them well and how much you know, when I wake up, I can think about how I want to be helpful today. I, I want to help them. I want to contribute. I, that doesn't mean I give up myself. It just means that alongside whatever is appropriate in terms of self-interest, I do think about, you know, being kind and loving to others. Uh, there's a place for intention. I found this fantastic, for me, quotation from Maureen Connor uh, a while ago. Um, 10 years ago, actually, she wrote, "As the earth, it's an invocation. As the earth gives us food and air and all the things we need, I give my heart to caring for all others until all attain awakening. For the good of all sentient beings, may loving kindness be born in me. Think about your own intentionality. In other words, yes, there's a natural lovingness. It's innate in us. It's innate in a sense in the ongoing emerging of the cosmos. Um, and, you know, we can be deliberate about it as well. Uh, one form of this loving at will, this deliberateness, is to recognize our interbeing. Uh, lately, I've been introduced to an idea or a, a culture, really, that may be more familiar to you uh, from Africa, uh, Ubuntu. Uh, sometimes summarized as, uh, I am because you are. You are because I am. We're bound together. 
Uh, and there's some teachings of this in uh, early Buddhism that I'll quote to you right now. As I am, so are others. As others are, so am I. Having thus identified self and others, harm no one, nor have them harmed. Sutta Nipata, another from the Samyutta Nikaya. Knowing that the other person is angry, one who remains mindful and calm acts for one's own best interest and for the other's interest too. It's that recognition of inner being, or a version of this that I'm fond of comes from Stephen Gaskin and his uh, Monday night class uh, back in the 60s in San Francisco. Stephen described karma as hitting golf balls in a tiled shower, <laughs> for better or worse, right? What we send out comes back. It's that recognition that we're, we're related to each other. We're bound together, right? Um, one thing that I find really helpful in terms of um, a deliberateness, a willfulness, and it's kind of catalytic because it draws you in, is to slow it down to recognize the being behind the eyes of the other person. And you could think of being not as a static entity, but rather as a process of being, you know, that can that that is a sort of center, it's kind of like a dynamic, you know, changing in some ways, center of core of being in that other person, the being behind the eyes. Because it's so easy to tune out people where we see every day or to tune out people on the street. Uh, it's really different where you just slow it down. To It's like a sacred landing. You let them land. You know, they don't even know, need to know you're doing it, although usually you do this, people shift. I've had the uncanny experience multiple times. I'm in like a Zoom discussion and there are multiple people talking or there, and I start to let the person in the, in the Zoom window land in me. And I, I start imagining, what is it like to be that person? Kaboom, something shifts in me and then they shift. <laughs> you know, they soften, become more real, more authentic in the moment. Deliberately seeing the person behind the eyes and continually regenerate that freshness, including in an ongoing relationship. The other thing I'll just add here is kind of I move toward an end, um, is to deliberately uh, um, evoke compassion in yourself. To, to As Gil Fronstel talks about it, a great teacher, um, stop for suffering. Like, oh, oh including subtle forms like weariness, stress, fatigue, even as people keep on going, or, you know, a secret sorrow. Um, many people carry a secret sorrow. There's this beautiful poem from um, Miller Williams. Have compassion for everyone you meet, even if they don't want it. What seems conceit, bad manners, or cynicism is always a sign of things no ears have heard, no eyes have seen. You do not know what wars are going on down there where the spirit meets the bone. So I want to finish by talking about just the kind of general practice of being free to love. Uh, no one can stop you from feeling the arising warm-heartedness, caring, you know, good intentions, deliberate leaning into compassion and respect, for example. No one can stop you from doing that. And um, I've been in relations with important people in my life who were not at all loving toward me and did not even want any outward expression of lovingness from me. Huh. But internally, I, could, I was free to love them. They may not receive it. They may not love me back. I was free to love them. You know, there's a famous story involving Nelson Mandela, um, great activist, of course, no longer alive in South Africa uh, during apartheid. And he was imprisoned. I think I have the fact right, 29 years at hard labor, terrible treatment. 
And one of his great sorrows, um, summarizing some stuff, one of his great sorrows he wrote about was that he was separated from those he loved. He did, you know, he was no longer in conditions uh, that um, enabled love, and so he started loving his guards. <laughs> and uh, it was actually said that in his loving of them, uh, while still being committed to liberation and revolutionary liberation uh, for the Native African people, uh, five out of six uh, in South Africa, while not giving up his rights and his political stance, he still loved his jailers, and they were no longer able to mistreat him so much, so they got replaced with other jailers, but he kept loving them too. It's a fundamental freedom you know, to be able to do this. That's a high bar, right? But it does say, wow, you know, if Nelson Mandela could choose to love the people that hit him, that jailed him, that mistreated um, all people he cared about, that actually murdered people he cared about, if he could find it in himself to retain that, you know, fundamental freedom in the human heart to choose to love, wow, I could do the same with that guy driving next to me on the freeway or, you know, that relative who, you know, is just kind of committed to uh, mistreating me. Um, so, okay. The last thing I want to say about this is that a way to relate to this is that there's a kind of outflowing through you of whatever does not, whatever feeds you as it flows through you. This is not about getting exhausted or codependent or making it your responsibility, you know, that other people are suffering. But it's, it's more a matter of as it flows through you, they move through the field of that, right? So your lovingness is, is, it's kind of radiating from you. It's rippling from you. It's where you come from. It's what moves through you. And other people move that move through that field. It's not dependent on who they are. Yes, the expression, the type, and so forth of that lovingness is affected by them, but you just live in this outflowing that feeds you and heals you and protects you even as it moves through you. Last, you are included in the receiving of this wellspring of love. Hmm. You are included. It is for you as well. If it twists your mind like a pretzel, a little bit as it does me to think about, I love me, what? Um, it's more that the lovingness flowing through you flows through the mind of you, flows through the personality of you, flows through the wounds you still carry. The lovingness flowing through you flows through the younger layers of your psyche. It flows through your sorrows. It flows through your guilt. It flows through the things you feel ashamed of. This lovingness flows through you too. And as it flows through you, you can feel a softening and even and easing that happens in you along the way. Just imagine what a world we could have together if more and more people were rested in loving freely in the ways we've talked about tonight. So let's see here. I think. And by the way, Nina makes an important comment at 23 minutes past the hour. I'm not saying anything here as a finger-wagging rule or an admonition. And um, I would re really recommend don't begin with edge cases like Vladimir Putin, who's you know driving Russia to invade the Ukraine uh, and with tremendous devastation and harm for example, start with, you know, what is it like for to have an arising lovingness with your cat or dog or, you know, the little picture of your grandchild on your, on your refrigerator or just to have a sense of basic goodwill as you walk past strangers on the street, you know, who are not harming you, they're not doing anything bad. Um, try there, start there and then see if it becomes 
increasingly um, universal. And don't fault yourself if there are certain people it's just not true for. Like the, you know, if they start moving through your field, you're going to pull that field in. Okay, okay, keep practicing. All right, okay, good. Yeah. Setting boundaries out of love. Sometimes out of love, we set a boundary. Um, and, and the lovingness is independent of the behavior you know, that we take. Okay. Looking for questions or comments I can respond to. Um, yes, Tony, at 15 minutes past the hour, um, is speaking to something that I have found is really important. We suppress a lot of things. We repress a lot of things. And um, one of them is love because it feels so uncool, right? Uh, or we don't know if it's wanted or maybe they won't return it. Uh, or maybe the expression of it kind of gets us into trouble. But the love itself is really sweet. It's really pure. Um, you know, and so you might ask yourself, huh, even in a relationship, uh, have you dialed it down? Kind of like a valve in you that you've dialed down that you could open up at least one notch and see what happens. And maybe just open it all the way to let whatever that fundamental goodwill, open heartedness. Uh, I like these terms because they seem simple and natural, open hearted. Goodwill, uh, wishing well, uh, you know, a kind of a teacher of mine called it a blessing disposition. Sort of doesn't have to be in a religious sense, but a just a ah, huh, may may it be well, may you have a happy new year, uh, may you be safe, may you be healthy, maybe you may you be happy, may you live with ease and other traditional wishes. Okay, so I'm looking through. Um, questions, comments, uh, let's see here. Yeah, people are talking about some of the limitations of this. It's okay. Rest in where it's real. Um, you know, I think of Brene Brown's line, which is a writer is relevant for me, write for your fans, not for your critics. Oftentimes people take a, a useful practice and then they go out to an edge case that's really extreme. And based on that edge case, they kind of give up the whole thing. No, just start with what's real for you and then build out from there. Build out from there. Um, maybe start with your fans in a sense or those who are close to you or at least you know neutral for you. And then you can move further and further outward um, to see if you can allow for your own sake, allow that field of goodwill to still be present as people move through it, who you also firmly believe should um, um, be engaged in a process of justice uh, for the sake of the greater good. Uh, see if you can have both be true for you. I mean, there are people for me that I look at them and I, I think, you know, you have harmed many people and it's for the greater good for you to be brought into a process of justice. and. I can see that for that person while not having any meanness toward them. There's no meanness in that, you know, attitude of justice seeking. So you can explore that. You can find that and see if that rings true for you. Okay. I like this quotation, Elaine, at 10 minutes past the hour, and I'll finish on this one from Abraham Lincoln. With malice toward none, with charity for all, all right? And that's the Buddhist teaching as well. Um, unbounded, unobstructed by ill will, omitting none. So thank you for your practice. Thank you for the wellspring of lovingness flowing through you.